Tonight, we're going to study for a little while, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. We're going to start in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Be strong in the Lord. Amen. You have that one? I do. Thank you. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Wow. Strong in the Lord. Even the Bible says it. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. We need Christ in our lives all the time so we can be strong. Anybody ever felt you weren't as strong as you should be any time? Sometimes have you ever worked out and wondered, I think I should do better than this. <laughs> If that's ever happened to you, you walked for a while and got worn out, any type of thing, you think, I just should be stronger. The Bible says, be strong in the Lord. There's a reason that he told us that, to be strong, be strong, be strong. Now, how do we get strong in God? Well, I'm going to give you just an insight. I'm going to give you a quick rendition of what we're going to cover. But if you're going to be strong, you've got to be in God's presence. If you're going to be strong, you got to crave the Lord. If you're going to be strong, you got to press into Jesus. I said so far, you got to be in the presence of God. You got to crave him. You got to press into Jesus. You got to desire the word. You got to stay pure. So I'll add those. That's pressing into Jesus, desire the word, stay pure. And give yourself to prayer. Now, that's a lot of stuff, but I'm going to cover them one at a time. I'm just giving you insight to where we're going. So we're going to start with being in the presence of God. Being in the presence of God. Psalm 16 and verse 11. Psalm 16 and verse 11. It says, You may know, or it says, You make known to me the path of life, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So it says we need to get in the presence of God so we can stay joyful. That brings strength. In His presence is fullness of joy. And staying in the presence of God brings you strength. It produces joy. It produces joy. In Exodus thirty-three fourteen. It says, in my presence, he said, my presence is going to go with you. I will give you rest. And that's in Exodus thirty-three fourteen. 14. In my presence, he said, you stay in my presence, my presence goes with you, and I will give you rest. So he's going to give you joy, and he's going to give you rest. Sometimes people say, well, I don't have much strength today. I don't feel too happy. They're missing the joy, number one. And sometimes people say, I don't feel too strong today. I need a nap. There's the rest. You're going to need joy and rest. That's what he said. I'm going to bring you in my presence. I'll bring you joy and I'll bring you rest when you're in the presence of God. Now, we've covered just one. That's just one. The second one is crave God. Crave. Crave God. Do you know that your, your craving God brings strength? In Psalms 105, Psalms 105, and verse 4, in the Amplified, I'm talking about the classic edition Amplified, it says, Seek and inquire for the Lord, and crave Him, and His strength, His might, that is His inflexibility to temptation, seek and inquire His face, and his presence continually forevermore. And if you do that, he says, you must seek the Lord and crave him. That's Psalms 105, verse 4. That's the Amplified Classic Edition. You've got to seek and crave him. In other words, getting close to God is God's plan. I want you to be close to me. Anybody ever had a relationship you were close to someone? I mean, really close. You could almost read their thoughts. You would you would speak what they were going to speak. You would feel 
like they'd start a sentence, you'd finish it. And that's close. Now that's close. But God... We do that all the time. We do that all the time. <laughs> but getting close to God is easier than with some people. Some people are hard to get close to. You do all you can to get close to them. I think we've misunderstood how you get close to God. Because I've heard more than one person tell me, I can't get close to God like you are. They've misunderstood. Because you got to have Him as a love. The Bible says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Love your neighbors as yourself. Love Him. He said, if you love the Scriptures, you prove to me that you love me. So, getting close to God is much easier than you realize. Because He's not busy in heaven too busy for you. I've had people tell me that, though. I say, well, have you prayed? Well, you know, God's pretty busy right now. <laughs> I mean, He's pretty busy. But God wants to hear from you. He's so busy, He wants to hear from you. There's room at the cross, the Bible says. There's room at the cross for you. There's room. He's not that busy. Let me help you. At the throne room, there are no lines. <laughs> Anybody been to the DMV? <laughs> Everybody had to wait? If you've ever been to the DMV and had to wait, this is not the way it is at the throne room of heaven. You don't have to wait to get into the throne. You don't have to wait to get close to God. He's wanting you to be craving Him. If you've ever yearned for something, some people that have been pregnant have certain cravings but you know, even non-pregnant people can have a craving. What do we call that? We've got a hankering for something? i got a hankering for those. I want them biscuits and gravy. got a hankering for... Whatever we have that desire for, that's how we're supposed to be towards the Lord. We're supposed to crave Him more than we do air. We're supposed to crave Him. Now, how do we get ourselves to crave air? Well, let me put your head down in a a bathtub for a little <laughs> while and I can get you to crave air. If you're if you're without air, you're crave air. This is how God says when you're without me, you should crave me. You should crave me. Your craving of the Lord always makes room for you at the throne. Craving of the Lord. Craving of the Lord. Craving well, the great of the Lord. word is being thirsty. Yes, it is. Being thirsty. Yes, it desire. is. It's like the scripture it says, as the deer pants for the water, so my heart longs for you, Lord. That's, That's craving. craving. That is desiring Him more That's and craving. above anything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And some people have never been to that point where they're so thirsty they're about to dry up. But if you've been ever thirsty mm-hmm. and you had that, you had that. That's craving. Yeah. That's it craving. Going, that's gotta craving. Have gotta have it now. Have it. Number three. You gotta deepen your relationship with God. Now, I, I think this is a, a another misunderstood conception of being strong in the Lord. When you have a deep relationship with God, you are strong. I've had people tell me, even relatives, I don't want to talk about that Jesus stuff. Right? You believe differently than I do, but if they get into trouble. For any reason, guess who they call? <laughs> Could you pray for me? Well, I thought you didn't want that. Yeah, but things change. <laughs> I need somebody that's close to God. You know, your relationship with the Lord is not just because He wants you to be close. He wants you so in step with Him that He can tell you what you need to do. Turn right, turn left. I've had more than one time in my life God has led me to money. I mean, just, I was without money, and he led me to money. More than once. It's happened a lot. But one particular time when I was praying, I'd been sitting with another guy, and he'd been in the car with me, and we were going to do some work, and I needed some money that day. I, didn't, I, needed, I, I had to do the work to get some more money later, but I need some money now. I mean, like, 
like right now, I need to stop and I needed some milk and I needed some bread and we needed some stuff at home. I was like, I don't need to wait for money. I need some money right now. What can I do to get money right now? I'm thinking, well, that's at the time used to be able to, you know, get pop bottles out of the trash and stuff like that and turn them in. I'm thinking, okay, I got to get a couple hundred of those because they were worth two cents at the time, you know. So I was thinking, what else could I do? And I, I'm praying. I said, let's pray. Let's just pull over to the side here in the vehicle before we go to work and let's pray. And we're praying and we're praying and we're praying. And the Lord says, would you trust me? I know that guy didn't say anything. He's still praying. So I said, yes. He said, then start the car. I mean, it's all going on. I, it wasn't like an audible voice, but I had this sense. Start the car. I started the car. He said, drive down to the first light and turn right. I turned right. He said, go for about another hundred feet. When you get to that light, turn left. I turned left. He said, pull into this, this apartment complex. I pulled the apartment complex. And they had this fountain going off. It's called the Fountain. This is the name of the apartment complex. The fountain's going off. And he says, open your door. Open the door. There lay three $10 bills in the parking lot. Out the reach of my hand from the... I didn't have to get out of the car. It's within the reach of my hand. I reached down and picked up the three tens. I was so elated. I was so overjoyed. I was like, this was... I mean, I've received a whole lot more than $30. But that time, I hadn't received $30. I was like, dear Jesus. I was, I was just praising him. I was thanking him. I said, I had heard the voice of the Lord. It meant so much to me. I had a relationship with God. And I, could, I knew it. And I was telling this man, I said, this is uh, the Lord just sent me here. He told me to go here and go here. And he led me directly to it. I reached out and picked up the $30. And he said, give two of them to this guy. There were three $10 bills. He said, give two of them to him. I was shocked. <laughs> and I took two of the tens and I said, the Lord said to give you two of these. And he just went on about, yes, I need money. And, and I said, you know, I was praying quietly. I said, no, I don't understand this, Lord. He said, he can't hear me. I went, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. But that ten went further than all 30 could be together. So I took that tin, got some milk, got some bread. I was so happy to come on with that stuff. This is a deep relationship with God. If you don't have that, the only thing that's separating you from a deep relationship with God is you. You make the decision how deep you want to have a relationship. It's like our relationship only depends on how we treat one another. Your relationship with God depends on how you treat Him. Do you spend time in his presence? Do you spend time hearing what he has to say? Sometimes we say, yeah, I'm I've been praying. Praying is not always just saying what you want. Mm -hmm. Praying is sometimes getting quiet and saying, what do you need me to do? Mm -hmm. On more than one occasion, he said, I want to bless you. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> okay, yes, sir. I like that. Yes, sir. And he said, I want you to get some money and go buy some groceries. How many times did he do that to us? Mm -hmm. Lots of times. Go get some groceries. And so I told you, I said, well, the Lord said we got to go get some groceries and give them away. So we go to the store. Pastor Jenny says, you get a basket and I'll get a basket. I'm like, we don't even get two baskets when we're shopping for us. What do you mean? You get a basket, I get a basket. So we're going down the aisles, and she's looking at all the stuff at this level, you know, because they put everything that's the highest price where, where, right where you can reach it. If you want a better price, you got to get really low or you got it really high. But all the stuff that's going to cost you is usually right here. That's the way they set it up. And so she's loading stuff up, brand name, everything. You know, when we go, sometimes she'll look at a package and decide what's in it and things like that. But when we're shopping for someone else, it's always the best. It's like, wow. And we filled up those things and, and took them to people's house. But there's something about the relationship with God. It's not a relationship with the devil. The devil doesn't tell you to give stuff away. So if you're curious... If you've heard from God or not, if he's telling you to give something, it's not God. It's not the devil. It's God. Mm -hmm. So you need to listen to that. Because you've got to deepen your relationship. In James 4, in verse 8, it says, Draw nigh to God, 
and he will draw nigh to you. James 4, verse 8. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Draw nigh to God. Now, he gives us some commands here. He says, when you draw near me, I will draw near you. But then he, he goes on and says, cleanse your hands. You sinners. Somebody help me. Why would he say that? Cleanse your hands. Cleanse your hands. I'm thinking our hands our hands are like what we do. And it should be godly. godly. Should be godly. We do. Yeah. Many times the actions with our hands are not godly. We do things that are Offensive, we say things and gesture, we do things with our hands that don't bring glory to God. But he says, cleanse your hands. Cleanse your hands. Giving is one of the things we do with our hands. You can't give by going, oh, take that. <laughs> you got to get it and give it to someone. That's kind of how it works. It's that way with a lot of things, especially with your hands. He said, cleanse your hands. But then he says, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Why would he say that? What is double-minded? The double-minded part comes from James also that says, anybody remember what it says? Purify your heart. It says, grieve and mourn and wail and change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. <laughs> yes, well, there's there's a little bit more that talks about uh, double-minded when he says when you're double-minded, it's like the waves of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Don't let that man think he'll receive anything from God because he's double-minded. It's in James 1. That's what it says in James 1. No, James, James, 1. 1. James 1. A person says one thing and they do another. Well, you you have it right there. Yeah. Read that part. Which one? Well, just read this. Start there in James 1. It starts there in... Uh, I think it's... It says... That, it says um, you have to ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea. Now, dirt. here's the catch. Doubting is what he's talking about. Not being in faith. Doubting when you are timid about standing strong in God. You're timid about a scripture. You're doubting it's going to work for you. Somebody says, well, I'm going to see you doing this, and you're going to do that, and you go, I don't know, it doesn't work for me like that. That's doubting. The Word says when you doubt, you are double-minded. You believe on one hand, you don't believe on one hand. You trust Him on one hand, you don't trust Him on one hand. You, that's why you got two hands, because you do one way and you do the other. And so you've evened out, you have nothing. And that's how the waves are. They grow and they grow and they grow and they grow and they crash. And they grow and they grow and they grow and they grow and they they crash. And so what's the benefit of the wave? It only lasts for a short while. you got nothing. Surfers can tell you that. You ride for a few seconds, you got nothing. Nothing. You ride and you crash. And that's the way doubt works. It keeps you from getting where God's trying to take you. So he says, purify your hearts, double-minded. That means don't let doubt creep in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Don't let doubt creep in. And let me encourage you. You need a renewed quest to seek the Lord daily. Now, we've been saying, seek the Lord. The Bible says, seek the Lord. Seek the Lord with all your heart. Those that seek the Lord will find Him. And He says, those that seek Me, He says, seek Me, you're going to be rewarded for seeking Me. Matthew uh, 6.33. You'll be rewarded. There's a great reward. However, you need a renewed quest in your seeking the Lord intimately, daily, daily. Anybody ever had to pray as a kid? Had to get up on your bed at night like this and mom and daddy would stand there. Go ahead, say your prayers. And you'd say, 
Yang ngeblesin mami dari bless, <laughs> bless little Jimmy <laughs> and bless my dog. Okay, and they go, oh, that's so cute because they were trying to help you get an intimate relationship with God, and they were doing the best they could do. I was never taught that I need to say my prayers before bed. I was never taught that I need to spend time with the Lord by myself and and be intimate in my relationship with Him. But I found out that there's something that I've got to have for me because it builds my strength. When I spend intimate time with God, I feel strong. I feel like I got something because He's on my side. I don't doubt it. He's right there. He's with me wherever I go. So you got to deepen your relationship. You need to build a new, a brand new awareness of how close you are to the Lord. Anybody here say that you understand how much God loves you? Anybody know that? Mm-hmm. We know God loves us. But let me challenge you. It's deeper than you think. How much does He love us? You know, we tell each other we love each other, gosh, 30, 40 times a day maybe, mm-hmm. more. And it's not that we doubt it, but it's always good to hear. And I think sometimes we need to stand in the presence of the Lord and listen to Him. I love you, my son. I love you. There's a love, like we do on Mother's Day, we say, I love you, Mom. And You know, if we're if we're over 50 or 60 or, you know, 70, and, and we tell Mom, I love you. And, you know, if she's still around, and, and says it back, I love you too. But it's not the same as when you were a little child. I think we're kind of little children as unto our God. We're his sons. We're his daughters. Mm-hmm. We need to really love him. Love him. You know, I saw I saw a picture of, um, a few days ago. Somebody had um, come back from being overseas. He'd been deployed. And they put him inside of a box. And they brought this box and brought it in to his daughter. His daughter. Did you see it? I think so. They brought this in and brought it in to the daughter. And so, you know, the daughter was kind of excited when she saw his hand come out. Then everything changes. Oh, daddy, it's daddy. That's daddy. She's just a little girl. She went crazy. I think that God gets great pleasure when we are intimate and when we're close with him. So we need to make a new awareness of becoming close to God. I think we ought to make that a daily quest. I make a daily quest that I'm going to choose God. Now, number four, press in to Jesus, and it brings strength. Press into Jesus, it brings strength. Philippians 3 and 14, it says, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3 and 14. I press, I press. I'm pushing in. I press. If you know anything about the woman with the issue of blood from Matthew chapter 9, many translations say it like this. She pressed through the crowd so she could get to him. It's a relentless attitude to get next to God. I mean, not only should we deepen our relationship... But we ought to make ourselves do it. We ought to make ourselves get through there. She expected something from him, and she pressed through the crowd. Which brings us to number five. You need to rekindle your desire for the Word. It'll bring you strength. There are some people that read their Bible every day. They're very, very, very consistent. They just do it. They read no matter what. They're going to read. There are three or four chapters. Whatever they're going to read, they read. Now, I've read the Bible several times, but I have found for me, I have to find out from the Lord, what would you have me study? Where do you want me to go? It's a whole different relationship at this end where I'm not just reading it to read it. I'm reading it because I say, what do you want me to study? And he'll say, what are you, what are you dealing with? What are the people dealing with? What and he'll give me certain insight. This is to touch this. This is to touch that. And he'll give me certain areas. A lot of times he just gives me scriptures. And I look up the scriptures. And then I go, oh, wow. i got to see where that's going to lead me to the next one or the next one. And I'll be looking at things like this because there's a 
rekindling in my spirit to search out for the word. When I was been miraculously healed by the Lord, I'm going to tell you something. That was a time when I couldn't read the Bible. I couldn't read it. I'd look at it and I knew it said words. I didn't know what the words said. That's awful. There's nothing worse than not being able to read and not being able to pull that down. The Bible says Jesus is the Word. I felt a separation from the fullness of God because I couldn't. Now, He still stayed with me and reminded me I'm right here. I'm talking to you. I'm right here. I'll bring you through this. This is no big deal. This is an attack that you didn't ask for. There's never a good time to have an attack. You'll get through this. And I just held on to that. But he gave me a new desire for the Word. I think that since that day, it's been growing and growing and growing. I spend more time in the Word now than I ever, even in Bible school. My weekly time in the Bible is more. I feel strengthened by that. I feel strengthened by that. I feel like not just going to benefit me, but it's going to benefit somebody else. So I'm not always just studying for me. I'm studying for somebody that might need to hear something. And I I say, Lord, you know, this is great. I know this is going to benefit somebody. (laughs) And so that's kind of how he does me. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 2, 1 Peter 2 and verse 2, it says... As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. So you gotta you gotta rekindle your desire for the word. And it says with that you will grow. You will grow. Now, this is the same hand I was born with. Everybody look at your own hand for a minute. That's the same hand you were born with. But it's much bigger. It works better. How come? Because it grew. It's strengthened. It's strengthened because it takes nourishment every day. Sometimes we nourish our bodies two or three times a day. Four times a day. But they're nourished. The whole body has to continually be nourished. And God wants us to rekindle a desire for the word with that same way so that we will be nourished. We will be nourished. So you need to rekindle your desire for the word. And let me help you. You need to ask the Lord, what would you want me to study? Now I'm I'm saying this on purpose because he did it to me. What would you want me to study? There is a specific time in my life where I would, no matter what I was going through, If I needed finances or if I needed healing or if I needed relationships fixed or whatever, I'd just go and purposely study that. That's where I'd stay. Until I got that thing changed, then I'd go study something else. And whatever I needed, that's where I'd stay and study. And that was good for a long period of time. But there comes a point in your growth where you kind of go, I don't just need to fix me. I want to be able to help somebody else. What would you want me to study? That's a whole different type of rekindling your word with him. Now, number six. Number six. Keep your life pure. I mean, if you've got a chance to do something that's not pure, don't do it. <laughs> because you've got to keep your life pure. If you want the strength of the Lord, he says, purify yourselves. Keep yourself strong in the Lord. Purify yourself. Keep yourself pure. Second Timothy 2 And verse 21, I'm taking this from the New Living Translation, 2 Timothy 2, verse 21. It says, if you keep yourself pure, it tells us that, if you keep yourself pure, you will be like a special utensil used for honorable use. Wow, you mean just by being pure, God will use me? Yes, a special utensil. Your life will be clean and you will be ready for the master's use for every good work. I think that's pretty amazing. Just by being pure, yes, if you live a pure life. Now, we have opportunity every day 
to miss our pureness. Every day. We can have thoughts. We can say things. We can discourage people. We can bring up disagreements. We can try to stir up strife with our brothers. You say, I wouldn't do that. Really? Well, I know um, it seems like that we take great pleasure when someone else has a little fault. They got a little problem. We dig at the problem. We mention the problem. We poke at the problem. We bring up the problem. And we continue to do that so much so that some people are, they won't even come around anymore because we've mentioned their problems so many times. And you say, oh, I'm, I might have a relative or two like that. <laughs> well, they, they got tired of hearing us being so holier than thou. Well, I think if we're going to keep our life pure, it doesn't say keep your life pure and also theirs. It says keep your life pure. It doesn't say you have to correct everybody. I know this is going gonna, gonna to be a surprise to some people, but it's, it's not your job to be Holy Ghost Junior. <laughs> he didn't call you to correct everybody. He is the corrector. He will lead you into the truth. You, here's, here's another big, here's big line here. You don't always have to say everything you know. Just because you know what they need to do, you don't have to tell them, you know what you need to do. <laughs> Just because you know, not everybody needs to know what you know. But you need to pray and ask the Lord, what would you have me do? What would you have me say? Jesus said this, I only say what the Father tells me to say. I only do what the Father tells me to do. Do you know that Jesus could have said a lot of things? Especially when they're getting towards the end there where they decide to crucify him. And he said he could have called 10,000 angels. He could have just went, yo, dad, kill them all. <laughs> this, is, this is bad. Just do them in. But he knew his purpose was greater than his own flesh at that moment. We need to know what our purpose is. It's greater than our own flesh at that moment. So, yes. He said, I don't want you to have the outward appearance of holiness. But actually, because that is a holier than now, when you have an outward appearance of holiness, we want other people to see us as holy. We want other people to yeah, recognize us as holy. Just see me as holy. But he wants us to have an inner holiness. Because that's where he knows us as an inner man. Don't play church. Let me help you. I'll say it again. Don't play church. Some people are very good at it. They play church. They play church when they're in church. And they don't play church when they're out of church. <laughs> they say what they want to say. I know one man at a particular time, happened years ago, he had a relatively new car. Him and his wife were going out to the car. He was, oh, yeah, brother. Yes, brother. Glad to see you. Good to see you. Everything's good. I'm just glad to see you, brother. Just glad to see you. And he got out to the parking lot. And he started, I mean, he thought it was out of eye shot for me. But he started just, just bad-mouthing her in the parking lot. And I could hear it from where I was. And when I, the pastor parked right next to the back door. Now, he wasn't at the back door. I parked not too far from the back door because I always came in the back door. But he had parked, just turned the corner, and where the building had ended, he was over on that side, as close as you could get to the building. And he was just letting her... He just got finished calling me, brother. He just got finished loving on me. He just got finished telling me how I have a good week and just went on. And he just heard the message. And he walked out of the parking lot, turned the corner. He's about three cars down, and he is ripping into his wife's flesh by his words. She's crying. I turned the corner to go see what's happening, because I could hear the screaming where I stood. And he went, oh, I'm so sorry, honey, that you're going through this. <laughs> what's she going through? He did this. 
He's trying to make me think she's having a problem that I didn't know about, and he's trying to help her. But I could hear that he was already calling her names in the church parking lot. He just got finished hearing the message. Now you say, well, that's, you know, that's no big deal. It happens all the time. It is a big deal. We're supposed to go in and come out changed. We're supposed to go in and come out changed. We're supposed to receive the things from the Lord. So I encourage people, don't play church. If we are acting a certain way in the church, then act that way all the time. Amen. Clean up your life. Demand of yourself that sin has to go. No, I haven't. I haven't got to uh, seven. This is still six. This is keep your life pure. Demand of yourself that sin has to go. You got to tell sin no. And how often does sin come? Let me see. Um, all the time. We're we are tempted all the time to get angry or get upset or get bitter or get uh, unforgiveness. You know, when somebody does you wrong. Have we ever been done wrong? We've had some stuff done wrong to us so much we could feel our blood. Write a book. We could write a book. It'd, it'd be volumes <laughs> of the wrong stuff that's been done to us by folks that are Christians. And for whatever reason, they were following in the footsteps of the words of sin and they were trying to get me to blast up in sin because I was feeling bitter I was feeling hurt I was feeling offense I was feeling like I needed to strike back there was more than one time I wanted to have vengeance on my own more than one time in fact I said this in church before but it's true I would drive by a person, particular people's house that had hurt me and I go, <laughs> and one day I was doing that. I just go, <laughs> and, and the Lord said, "What are you doing?" I said, "Glory Bob." <laughs> <laughs> he said, "You're not fooling me, and you're sure not fooling yourself. That's not glory bombs. That's just bombs." <laughs> and he said, "Don't do that anymore." And I went. Okay. <laughs> For heaven's sake, I was, I was so hurt because he was watching me. I was like, and then it dawned on me, oh yeah, <laughs> he can see me all the time. <laughs> I just felt bad because I felt like I was being policed. You know, like when the police are following, you go, you know, you put both hands on the wheel, you know, you don't touch your phone, and, and, and you move, and you just go a little slower, you know. Well, then when they go away, you speed back up, and you pick up your phone, and you know. Well, the Lord is always with us. He can see us whatever we're doing. Thank God, well. Thank God for that. And He wants us to not carry ourselves with anger. Because when we get angry, we're not, we're not blessing God. It's not showing God glory. By our sometimes our conversation is just like, well, what do you think it means? And say, you don't have to be angry. I wouldn't be angry. It sounded like it to me. And I think that sometimes we're defending our action when we're, we're kind of embarrassed that we acted that way to begin with. So just just uh, stop it before it starts. In other words, be pure. And be holy and serve the Lord Christ. Now, number seven. Give yourself over to prayer. Now, more than just craving God, more than just seeking the Lord, more than just being in His presence, more than just having a new rekindled awareness or a new understanding of the Word, I'm talking about being in prayer. Being in prayer. Anybody ever... Look up how often Jesus was in prayer. We we have a a little notion because not everything about Jesus was written, but we have a little notion that like the night before he was crucified, he was in the garden and he was praying. Thank you, Lord. I love you, Lord. The Bible said he was sweating blood. It was that it was that violent that. 
intense. It was that intense that there there's capillaries in our body that's so close that if you put enough stress on it, it'll actually make blood come out your body. And that's where he was. I mean, he was he was feeling the stress just as we do. He felt every way as a man. And and something very important. How much did he pray? Well, that night we know that he prayed and he went back to his disciples and they'd fallen asleep and, and he had to stir them up and he went back and prayed and came back to the disciples and they'd fallen asleep and he went back and prayed and, and came back to the disciples and he said, can't you even wait with me? Can't you pray with me one hour? And so from that, we've adopted this idea. If you pray an hour, you are holy. <laughs> Well, holy, if you could pray an hour, you were some kind of holy dude right there. If you can pray an hour, that's holiness. That, that's that's the mark of holiness right there. And in First Timothy 2 and verse 1, it says, I urge you. One translation says, I beg you. First of all, that your petitions, that your prayers, that your intercession, and that your thanksgiving be made for all people. How many people are in America? Any idea? Lots. How many people in America? 240 million? 460 million? How many you think? And about 300 and almost 400 million. Almost 400 million. That's a fact. And he says you ought to pray for everyone. Okay, so you take a second apiece. How long is that? Hello. <laughs> Hey, what if you just do a blanket prayer? I pray for everybody. That works. That right? works, right? Yeah, sure we have. But if we're going to pray, don't you think we ought to spend a little bit of time? Anybody ever been with a friend and you say goodnight and you stand in the parking lot for two more hours and talk? <laughs> and then they finally go, how can I have to go? It's nine o'clock already. i got to get up for the morning. <laughs> and And... Finally, but you left them at seven, and at nine you're still standing there. There's more than one time that we have had children that like to say goodbye, and then they talk about it, and then they talk about it, and then they talk about it. So much so that Pastor Jenny felt a little uncomfortable one night because they'd already said, I'm coming home, or something. And they were still saying their goodbyes. And she drove to find them. Where are they? <laughs> I figured they'd be home when they get home. Because they already say, they're saying their goodbyes. They're like everybody else. They, they have some kind of a relationship that doesn't allow them to exit quickly. We sometimes sit down with a meal with somebody. And we can just share. We just we share and not share. We just say everything and nothing. And just laugh. And just have a good time. Because that's the kind of relationship we're supposed to have with God. It's one of those things where, you know, it's not just what you say. It's not just your petitions. It's not just your prayers. It's not just your intercession. It's the combination of them all. And sometimes it's just listening. And that's still prayer. That's still prayer. Because sometimes in that quiet time in listening, that's where I hear the voice of the Lord the clearest. Now, I'm not saying he spoke with an audible voice, but I mean, way down in my spirit, I got instruction that I... This happens to me a lot in prayer. When I'm in the midst of prayer, he'll give me instruction for things that I need to do. I wasn't even thinking about that. I wasn't even, I wasn't even talking about that. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even share it. I was talking about something else. And he'll say, you know how you fix that? I'm like, well, that's out of left field. But it's something I had requested from the Lord at some time before I just hadn't stayed in the throne room long enough to hear the answer and then he shares it with me I'm going to say give yourself to prayer and if you haven't set a specific time start with a few minutes work yourself up to an hour and Sunday I'm going to show you a couple of places where Jesus prayed all night so Amen now for the next few minutes, <laughs> that's fun so far. It's being strong in the Lord. For the next few minutes, I'm going to give you some habits that will help you get strong. 
strong in the Lord. He said, be strong in the Lord. So don't you think you need some habits? Amen. You need some habits to be strong in the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 8, verse 34 and 35, it says, Blessed is the man that listens to me. That's taken from the New King James. Blessed is the man that listens to me. Watching daily at my gates. Now, wait a minute. we got listening and watching. And then the third part, it says, And waiting at my posts of my doors. So you got listening, watching, and waiting. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. Now, I'm saying that to say this. There are certain habits that we can start with, and one of them is being blessed. And he tells you, this is the blessed. This is the blessed. You're blessed if you listen to me. You're blessed if you watch for me. You're blessed if you wait for me, waiting for the Lord. You're blessed. You are blessed. Blessed, blessed, blessed. For whoever finds me, if you've been waiting for me, you will find me. Whoever finds me obtains favor. That makes you blessed. Now, strong Christians, number one, strong Christians need to feed their spirit. If you want a habit to make you strong, feed your spirit. Feed your spirit. Matthew 4 and verse 4, he answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Anybody heard this one before? How shall man live? Every word that, Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's how man shall live. Now, did he did he say that to the devil? Yes. That was Jesus' words to the devil when he tried to get him to turn the stone into bread. It was trying to get him to crave something to eat. He said, I'm hungry, but I need to crave the word more than this. Man doesn't live by just bread, although we think we do. So we eat meals more than we eat the word but you live by the words that proceed out of the mouth of God so you feed your spirit by reading the word every day how many ate today I'm going to eat again tomorrow <laughs> you already made up your mind <laughs> you're going to eat this month this month too? Wow. If you've already made up your mind to eat, don't you think you ought to make up your mind to strengthen yourself by feeding your spirit? Feed your spirit. Feed your spirit. We have a minister friend, Rick Renner. Rick is in Russia. But Rick has made an, a pact with the Lord. I will not eat my breakfast until I've read my word. And so there's some mornings, his wife brings in breakfast, and he goes, just set it right there, I'm not done yet. And he get his Bible and go on until he's done with his word, no breakfast. And you say, well, that's a little harsh. That's a serious Bible guy. He's feeding his spirit. He's feeding his spirit. So that's number one, is you got to be, to be strong in the Lord, you got to feed your spirit. Number two, a good habit to be strong, you got to build your faith. Number two, build your faith. Build your faith. In 1 Samuel 30 and verse 6, in the Amplified Classic Edition, it says, David encouraged himself and strengthened himself in the Lord. He encouraged himself and strengthened himself in the Lord. Now, what was he doing? Well, they just got to Ziglag. It seems the town was being burned down. All the men that he'd taken with him were against him. The women and children had been drug out and, and they would become slaves or, or at least they were captured at this time. So the men were ready to kill him, but he had to encourage himself. And strengthen himself. Anybody ever been to a point where you're like, ain't nobody else helping me? I need to help myself. 
If you need to be encouraged, you need to strengthen and encourage yourself. And how do you do that? Romans 10, 17 says this. You want to build your faith? You want to build your faith? That's bringing strength to yourself. You've got to build your faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Repetition is the key to building strong muscles. How many know that? If you do repetition, in fact, we call it that. When people are going to do deadlifts or whatever, we call it, how many repetitions are you going to do? We shorten it now. We go, how many reps are you going to do? How many reps are you going to do? And repetition is the key to building muscles. That's why the Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. Repetition. Repetition is the key to building faith. It's repetition. Because you've got to hear it and hear it and hear it. Now, anybody ever been to the gym? Been to the gym? Yeah. Did you notice the difference the first afternoon? No. <laughs> really? You mean just like faith, it has to be built? Oh. I think that muscle building is a whole lot like faith building. We don't recognize it even as it comes on us. Because when somebody's really built out, they look like Charles Atlas or something like that, they just go, I'm doing the best I can. They are not. They don't go, hey, I'm all that in a bag of chips. They're, they're, <laughs> they're thinking they got to still keep doing it. They don't want it to change. They want, I'm, I'm, just, I'm almost getting where I want to be. But with faith, sometimes we go, I did it last week. I tried that this weekend. You know, trying running will not make you a runner. <laughs> trying swimming doesn't make you a swimmer. Trying one night at the gym will not allow you to be a gym member. It takes repetition. And that's exactly what God's saying, is the repetition. And you know that encourage yourself, encouraging yourself and strengthening yourself comes by repetition you got to do it more often than you think. Anybody ever had somebody tear you down? Usually it's you. Let me say it again. Usually it's you. How do we do that? I'm so stupid. <laughs> I'm so dumb. I always do these dumb things. Come on. You heard that little voice and it's, it's you. And you hear it yourself and it deflates you. It defeats you. It defeats you. And here's the truth. Encouraging yourself is much like giving yourself a helium balloon. Where discouragement is like an anvil or a weight. It drops you down almost immediately. One word. You t say one negative word to yourself, you're ready to drop out. But you hear a positive word, it just it's like a little balloon. You're like, it didn't help me at all. How many balloons does it take? Little, I'm talking about 12 inch Helium balloons does it take to lift you off the ground? Yeah. We say a few dozen. Even those. Oh goodness, one now. You know they got those great big balloons in the Macy Day, the Thanksgiving Day parade, and they got a dozen guys on there, and it's bigger than a building, and they got a dozen guys holding it down. And you go, really? Yeah, filled with helium, and it's as big as a building. It probably takes a pretty good sized balloon to lift you up by yourself. A hot air balloon? Yeah, well, we hot air ourselves enough. <laughs> so we, need, we need to quit discouraging ourselves and encourage ourselves. It takes repetition, 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 repetition until you finally lift yourself up. You gotta to talk to yourself, you gotta encourage yourself, you gotta stand strong in the Lord, you gotta to listen to faith. You know, faith comes by hearing. It says it on purpose, hearing, by hearing. And it doesn't say faith comes by having already heard. It comes by hearing. You've got to hear it and hear it. And you've got to do the one talking to yourself. You've got to talk to yourself and lift yourself up and encourage yourself and build yourself up and strengthen yourself so that you can fight against the wiles of the devil. Strengthen yourself up with the Word. It's the key. Yeah, the repetition is the key to building strong faith. Number five, strong Christians must 
Speak the word. You want habits that are going to change you? Speak the word. The Bible says Jesus and the word are one. Guess what Jesus always spoke? The word. He and the word are one. (laughs) It was always the word coming out of his mouth. If you don't speak the word, you'll speak everything that will defeat you. You gotta speak the word. I'm talking about find the scripture and speak that. You're believing for healing? Speak only what the Bible says. Don't speak anything else. Don't speak what the doctors say. Don't speak what the, what the, what the therapists say. Don't speak any of that stuff. All you gotta do is continue to speak the word. If anybody asks anything, cause you'll hear lots and lots and lots of times when you get a chance to speak something else, you must speak the word only. Amen. That'll make you strong. Because when you're speaking it, and you've done it often enough, other people quit asking. If you will not move off of the Word, people quit asking. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life... Where's that? Where's the power? Death and life? Your own tongue. you got the power. you got the power. Mark 11.23 says it like this, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be removed, be cast into the sea, not doubt, not be double-minded in his heart, believe that the thing he said will come to pass, he will have whatever he has said. Amen. Essentially, let me say it like this, you become what you speak. You may never heard it that way before, but I think that's true too. You, you become what you speak. The Bible says that you think in your heart, so is he? I'm going to put it like this. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yeah, you speak whatever's in your heart. You plant enough word in your heart and you speak it, you'll become what you speak. Right now, you are, you are a result of what you speak. Essentially, you are what you speak. Romans 4.17 says, God calls those things as it is written. He said, I've made you a father of many nations, like he said to Abraham. Before him whom even God, he believed, even God, he quickens the dead and calls those things that be not as though they were. How dare you talk about anything else that is just because it is. God calls those things that be not as though they were. Now there's a big difference there. If you have a broken arm... You can't go around saying, my arm's not broke. Mark, I clearly see your arm is broken. But you say, it doesn't say calls those things that are as if they are not. My arm's not broke. He doesn't say that. He said, go around saying, calling those things that be not as though they were. I have a healing. No, no, I have a healing. No matter what somebody says, I'm taking a healing. I have received it. By his stripes, I'm healed. Now, there's a difference. You've got to quote the healing, not quoting that you have abstained from what's real. You're quoting the healing, which is supersedes that which is true because it's the truth. Are you with me? That's going to help somebody. Amen. Don't be a bump on the log. It's too easy not to say anything. We do it to all kinds of things. We have trouble. We go, mm, 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 mm. We have a little spot on our neck and we go, mm, 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 mm. Got a little problem with our eye. Mm, 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 mm. Well, why don't we say something? The devil don't understand. Mm, mm, mm. You don't even understand. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> you need to speak the word. Amen. Amen. Now, number four. Strong Christians control their thoughts. I'm getting a little too passionate. Aren't I? Mm-hmm. Strong Christians control their thoughts. Second Corinthians 10, verse 3. It says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. 
casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought, every thought, every thought, every thought, the obedience of Christ. Let me ask you a question. How many thoughts do you think a day? Um. Scientists say you think between 30 and 60,000 thoughts every day. And if you're in a high-paying job, it's usually 70 to 100,000 thoughts. That's because they require so much more. But I'm talking about, put it all together, we're between 30 and 60,000 thoughts a day. Wow. Wow. And he says, bring every thought to the obedience of Christ. Let me give you a for instance. You drive down the road, and the guy on the other side is getting a little close to the yellow line. Okay, pull it over, pull it over. You don't say it, but you're thinking. <laughs> Get on your side. Sometimes you do. If it's getting closer to you, and you can't stand it anymore, you Get on your side, mister. You'll say what's on your mind. And it's been in there probably four or five times before you spoke it. But you won't say, By his stripes I'm healed even though he's trying to get that thought to be obedient to Christ. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Because that is a fallacy of not being strong in your thought life, taking control, taking control. When thoughts wander, it's kind of like this. I believe I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. I believe I'm healed. I'll be healed soon. I thank God someday I'll be healed. I hope I get healed. I'd like to be healed. I'm not sure God's going to heal me. And how did it break down to that negative thing? You take 50 people, put them in the same room, you light them up, one, 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 start at the back, and you do any motion. And you tap the person on the... Because the first group can't look. Only the person that you've tapped is looking at you. And the first, you do the same motion to this guy. It'll go about three people before it's changed. You cannot hold a thought without it changing on you because there's way too many interjections by other things. I don't remember exactly what it was. I hope I'm doing it right. And by the time... The week has passed. The month has passed. You're no longer saying, by his stripes I'm healed. You're saying, I was healed, I think, maybe by his stripes. Because you forgot what it said. That's why I said, keep the word in front of you. So, you have to be a strong Christian, control your thought life. you got to make yourself resist the temptation to change the word. Because it works every time. Resist that temptation. Never let a thought go unanswered. If you got a thought and it's not of God, don't you dare let it go unanswered because the devil's trying to plant that thought in your head. You gotta tell it, No, I will not let that happen to me. I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. Because when you let a thought go unanswered, it'll play against your mind and it'll plant a seed. And later on, it'll leak out your mouth when you least expect it. You're talking to someone and say, I don't think God's going to heal me. Oh. And they say, why'd you say that? I don't know. Because it's in your thought life. Amen. Now, number five. Strong Christians anchor their life with praise. Praising makes you a strong Christian. Let me read you Psalms 34, verse 1. I will bless the Lord. Help me somebody, what's it say? At all times. His praise will be once in a while. What's excuse me? Oh, yes. Continually. Once in a while on my lips. I'll do it on Sunday if I feel like it. I hope I'm feeling good enough to sing Sunday. I've had people tell me on a Friday, I'm not sure I can make it Sunday. I had a cough yesterday. 
What? Where's the praise of God on your lips? Where's the thanking God by His stripes I'm healed? This is Friday for heaven's sake. You still got all day Saturday. You got Sunday morning. It's all day Friday you got. You got all day Saturday. You got Sunday morning before you even have to be there. But they won't show up and they say, I had a cough Friday. I'm telling you, we got to grab a hold of this stuff. Praising is a language. Some people don't understand this, but it's a language of faith and it's a language of receiving. When you're praising Him, no matter what's going on, you praise Him. That means I'm going to trust you anyway. I'm not trusting this stuff. I don't believe in this stuff. I'm trusting you. I'm praising you. I receive from you. That's why I'm praising. Praising is a language. Praising puts you in a position of spiritual strength. When you praise, no matter what you see, it is strong. Paul and Silas, they got captured. They got put in prison. They got set in the stocks in the deepest part of the prison. So what they decided to use, what they decided to say, I'm sure Silas went, man, these things are bad, Paul. <laughs> Ain't no light in here. It's like hell. It's like there's no light. We can't see nothing. It's terrible. What are we gonna do? Paul said, "I think we ought to sing." <laughs> what do you think? I think singing's in mind. No, he didn't even complain. He said, "What do you want to do?" Paul said, "Let's sing." Okay, let's go. Darkness and all, in stocks and all, they was praising. Gave them strength. God got so excited about the faith they showed in their singing unto the Lord, the receiving from Him. He got so excited, He just opened all the doors <laughs> and shook everything up. There was a great earthquake and the doors opened. I imagine the lights came on. Are you with me? <laughs> and it all happened in just a few moments because strong Christians pray. And if you don't know how to pray, pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. It is a very wise form of praise because it's always speaking what the Lord's Spirit wants to speak. That's a very wise form of praise. You let that word come out of your mouth. It is praise to the maximum. That's how you build yourself up in your most holy faith because you're speaking how do you build yourself the Bible says faith comes by hearing hearing by the word when you're speaking in the Holy Spirit when you're praying in tongues you build yourself up the Bible says in your most holy faith because you are speaking the word the word speaking through you amen amen <laughs> praise God <laughs> amen so that was number six. Strong Christians pray. Strong Christians pray. And let me give you another one. It says, build yourself up in your most holy faith, which is to edify. Edify. Edify means to improve, to uplift, or to encourage. That's what David was doing. He encouraged himself. That's number six. Now, number seven. Number seven. Strong Christians dump the baggage. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Ever met somebody that carried some baggage into their Christian life? Oh yeah. All Christians need to get rid of their baggage. Hebrews 12 and verse 1 it says, it says, Therefore we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that's going to trip us up. Get rid of the baggage. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Amen. So, strong Christians have got to rid themselves of the baggage. What kind of baggage are you carrying? Sometimes people been hurt. They say they're, they forgave, but they still talk about it. Some people dealing with health issues. They believe in God, but they can't help but talk about it. This is what I'm going through. Pray for me. This is what I'm going through. What kind of baggage? Worry, stress, 
fear, unforgiveness. And here's what I ask you to do. Make a decision today to rid yourself of any baggage. And it'll make you strong. Be strong in the Lord. (laughs) That's all I have.